th this uh, experience for me uh, doing looking at survival analysis was interesting because it's not something I use. Right. I signed up for it partially because I thought, wow, how embarrassing. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, but yeah, I can definitely tell that this is something, a topic. Well, it's not covered in their book like it's covered in a lot of other books. And I know this because when I was making the presentation, I wanted to kind of look around uh, and see other presentations. And um, I don't know if any of the three of you use survival curves or learned about them. But usually there's this whole exposition of all the parametric versions. So there's like a exponential decay. And there's like a Y bowl and there are different types of Y bowls and all sorts of things. And in this book, they just psh, <laughs> don't do any of that. Um, and there's also kind of a lack of intuition building. Anyway, this is all uh, a, a prologue to why my presentation is going to be the way it's going to be. <laughs> no problem. Well, it's five after, so I think uh, continue from that prologue, <laughs> and let's uh, let's see what we let's see what we see. Okay. Um, All right. All right. I'm going to make all of your beautiful faces be small. And uh, everyone can see my screen, right? It's still the non optimal PDF, but I did figure out how to make it as big as possible um, since I can't do a full screen PDF as I was determined once. Anyway, so is it mostly a full screen of a PDF for yes. all of you? Yes. Okay. All right, so yeah, so we're in uh, whatever chapter this is, 11. Um, oh yeah, I think some of my bullet points are gonna be, are the, well, you'll see a lot. For some reason I thought uh, it was a deep learning chapter. Uh, in any case, so, all right, so we'll just start off. And so um, I'm gonna pretend like you haven't read anything about the chapter. Um, and one of the things that I've gathered in the last week of uh, trying to learn these things is that Really, I think the place to start with this whole arena of survival analysis is with what your data would look like if it were appropriate for you to do survival analysis. And your data would look something like this. Your data, um, you know, you you might have some ID, you might not, um, but basically you have these two columns. You have an event column, um, which is the last time you see your subject and then you have a column that's called something like observed it can have different names it could be censored it could be the opposite um where you say what happened the last time you saw your subject why was it the last time you saw your subject now if th there's an event a relevant event uh you would call it you would say observed so this is an indicator column also I mean, it's not zeros and ones, but it's indicating something, a binary state. So either you, you observe them, do the event, and that's, I'm keeping that vague for a reason, or for some reason you lost them. Now, there's something that I'll get to later, but so here, one of these was censored because your study ended. We're gonna say that your study went through, uh, I, I don't know, you went through 12 months. You had a year long study, we'll say. Um, but you can have a, a, a participants or units, to keep, it, keep it more vague, that are lost because of something idiosyncratic to that person. So we'll, we'll, I'll cover those more later. But the basic idea is that you have an event column, last time you saw your subject, and then you have an observed column saying basically, why was that the last time? And, and then if you were to pl plot that, your data would look something like this. Um, the axes aren't important. So I, I know the text is um, incredibly small. Um, but basically, you have uh, the beginning of your study. And so this is a, a nice orderly version where everyone begins or every unit enters the study at the same time. Um, it could be that way if you're looking at age and years as the, the end and you just know that everyone starts living at zero. <laughs> everyone starts living at zero. It's a great equalizer. Um, 
And you basically have two types of observations, again, going back to that binary column. You have those that are that you see the whole way through, and then you have those that exit the study um, for reasons that are not due to the, the event that's of theoretical interest. So here I've colored all the ones where we actually observe the end state. Uh, well, we, we see the event happen in this, in ours, teal. Does anyone know the official, the names of these colors? Kind of like a burnt -y orange, red, and kind of teal green. I don't know. You can put it in the chat. It's not germane to the actual topic, but I get, I'm surprised I haven't looked that up. Anyway. All right, so that, this is what your data will look like. And again, I think this is the, the real essence of, of survival analysis, both the censoring, so again, the two different colors in this graph, and sort of what we'll call time to event data. Uh, so having a column that is time to event. And now to put some, some actual context on this. Um, so the event uh, started out at least, um, so this, this statistical framework uh, from what I understand, it was popularized in uh, biomedicine. So the reason it's called survival analysis is because people survive until they die and they can differentially survive uh, given certain treatments or certain characteristics or belonging to a po certain population. And so mortality research, mortality slash longevity research uh, would be one. Um, and again, that's where it gets its name from. And kind of like, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever taught a, an introduction to statistics class where you're teaching or just talking to someone, a little bit more weird, but about like a Bernoulli or a binomial distribution. And it's just a convention to call uh, one of the two outcomes a success. And oftentimes people have this perverse thing where like death is success. And you kind of have to explain to people, okay, well, that's just the, we're just calling death success. Don't make any inferences about me here. Uh, this is the same way. There's that same dynamic where uh, some people will just go through whatever they're talking about is like survival until death, even if you're talking about, for example, uh, churn. <laughs> like, uh, so, you know, um, businesses might be interested in modeling customer churn or employee turnover, uh, as uh, employee churn is often called. And there you're thinking about someone's tenure. Uh, as they either a customer or employee until they they leave right so that's the same you could think about that uh, as having the same structure as this you would have your customer or um, employee id they're there for a certain tenure so that they are served for a certain duration so the which is you know uh, has a one-to-one -one correspondence with when the event happens relative to the beginning um, and then observed would be a little bit weird if you didn't know uh, well, actually, no, I was going to say it would be weird in the employee case if you didn't know when they left, but imagine you're doing a study, there are still employees uh, when the study ends, and you want to include them in your sample, so every employee who's still an employee at the end of your study um, is going to be censored in this way. Um, so then there's, uh, in, in my field, political science, uh, these, these models are most often used in international relations, which is not my subfield, um, but they might study conflict out, outbreaks. So the units there would actually be dyads of countries. And you would observe what you call a spell of peace until a conflict outbreak. And that would be the event. Um, and so what these have in common uh, are that they're sort of more abstractly beyond you know, survival and death is that there's time and time to, until event or duration. So that's that. Um, and so the, the, the concepts there are gonna be event, again, oftentimes called death. Then there's the non-event spell, which is the survival. And then there's the duration. And people do make, and there's a little bit of a, so, so event and non-event are like the two states. Uh, and then duration is the time that one, is, that one spends in the first, or sorry, in the second state, the non-event state, until the event state. These are just the words that are gonna be, going to be thrown around. Uh, any input from the crowd so far? Uh, it's, it's interesting, as you say, the way the terminology that originates in literal survival analysis kind of, I, I, I was amused by the idea, just jumping ahead a little bit about papers being at risk for publication. Mm. 
<laughs> as one of the examples. But yeah, it's it's funny the language that's used. Yes, yeah, that's probably the, <laughs> that's the best one. Papers at risk for publication. Yeah, people are just at risk of marriage. That's another one you have to watch out out there. <laughs> But that'd be interesting to run a predictive model on someone and say, you're very at risk of marriage. Watch out. Or congratulations, you know. Um, okay. Um, so let's see. Duration, so time until event. Oh yeah, but sometimes duration is not time until event. If we don't observe the event, it's time until they're censored for us. Okay. Um, so uh, here are the, the formalizations. That are that are that are in the book. Um, so, like, you know, we're going to denote our dependent variable y. Um, so now we're, we're thinking about our data, right? Um, but because of of censoring, what that variable is uh, is not just the observed outcome of theoretical interest necessarily. It's the minimum of t and c, where t is the true survival failure or event time. Um, oh, I should have mentioned failure. So that, that I think I've, I've gathered is the second area arena from which uh, this research comes from. It's like um, looking at parts of machines. And so those parts fail. And uh, so they also have failure time. Event time is by far the most neutral, but, uh, and actually in, uh, in political science, this discipline is, area of analysis is called event history analysis. Um, so yeah, so so event, so there's that. Um, and C is the censoring time. So um, with the, the minimum operator, what that means is just that the observed outcome is whichever one of those things happens first. Um, so that's one key piece of this. And then we also observe uh, an indicator, and by the way, these are just the same two columns that I showed up at the very beginning and with a random, random but concrete example. So you have that Y column, which in my case I had called event, but again, could have equally well been called or perhaps better been called duration. Um, could, have, could have perhaps been more warmly called uh, time at death or age of death, whatever. Uh, anyway, we observed that, and then there was another column that was, uh, could have been an indicator function a uh, dummy column with uh, ones and zeros, where it's a one if, uh, and there's a little argument down there, if uh, C is greater than or equal to T. So basically if it's uh, censored. So uh, I, I have not found that there is a super strong convention for having it be a censored versus um, survival, or sorry, a censored versus observed column. So I think in the book, they must prefer, they must say it's a censored uh, column for sen So if any of you do survival analysis, I'd be interested to know if you find that it's a really strong convention one way or the other. I, I found it not to be the case, but if you're using R packages, you know, watch out, make sure that your, um, that your indicator function, sorry, that your dummy column has the right it's putting ones where the ones should be and not where zero should be. Um, and so the way that gets put together is that for all your, your uh, rows, you'll have this, this pair, this tuple. Um, you'll observe the outcome or not, or the censored, the censoring, and you'll observe the indicator. And okay, so again, that's what your data looks like and um, in my week of uh, building up non-expertise, uh, what your data looks like is pretty pretty key to whether or not survival analysis is gonna be right for, for you in this case. Okay, but so censoring uh, is kind of the big new concept here. Um, so it's worth delving into that a little more. And um, so basically there are two causes of, of censorship. Um, it, there's the sort of en masse one, where again, this is the one where we can imagine that uh, you're doing, you're studying employee turnover in a company and you know you end this study before the company is over so everyone who is still an employee we didn't see when they left the company so their their observation their row is censored and so the way i think about it is it's just research or induce or it's uh it's a feature of the study that kind of censorship 
And then there's also idiosyncratic attrition amongst your your units. Um, and then so so that unit, that particular unit, leaves before the event occurs for them. Um, and so it's also referred to as dropout. I'm sure it has uh, a myriad of names, but but that's what it is. Um, so again, so these are like two pretty qualitatively different types of, of censorship. Um, now, um, there's there are kind of different, I'll go through this one relatively quickly because we're gonna, in this chapter, I believe they only discuss one type of, of the following censorship. So, well, two, these two. Uh, so an event can be non-censored. Uh, so we observe the entire interval. It can be right censored, which there are two ways to think about it. Uh, there's the very intuitive graphical way where it's, we do not observe the endpoint. Um, so for example, in the the one I, the graph, the, the yeah, the R graph I showed, uh, the ggplot graph I showed way above where we just know that everyone started at zero, right? The only way for this to be censored is to be right censored. Like we, we don't observe the, the endpoint of the study. Well, this oh, well, I won't belabor this point too much, but another way to think of right censoring that I think is a bit more, is less graphic, um, but I've seen is that, that the time to event is greater than the observed duration. And so you'll notice that that does cover, um, that does cover um, an, a, a situation where we don't observe the endpoint, right? So we, we know when they began, uh, and we don't know when they ended, but we know that they ended sometime later than the last time we saw them. So that, but it also covers a situation where we don't know when someone began. So, so imagine we're running a study uh, where we want to have some people train, given my certain circumstances, I, uh, uh, I've been listening to someone who's practicing their, their vocal routines recently. And so imagine we are interested in, in doing that. We're interested, we're researchers wanting to make the world uh, uh, full of, of good singers. So we have some people uh, come in and do, do vocal training and we wanna see uh, when they can reach a certain note because we need a well-defined endpoint for a survival analysis study. So we wanna see when they can reach some octave of, of C with a beautiful shining vibrato. Um, but imagine that we learn much to our dismay that uh, after the fact, after this whole study has been run, uh, that uh, four or five of our participants, and it was a small study, so this is a big, this is a high proportion. Um, they had been taking vocal lessons in a style very similar to the lessons that we were giving uh, before um, we we started giving them lessons. And so, how would we incorporate that? So, like, what would we do with that information? Well, you know, if we knew how long, then it actually wouldn't be an issue um, because we would have. We would have we would observe the entire interval, right? So be, they would be uncensored. Oops. But if we just know, if all, the only thing we know is that they began at some point before our study, um, we would say that they were right censored, even though we actually do observe the endpoint. So I've been hopefully that <laughs> that was worth it that we came around. Uh, so it's a weird way to think about it, it being right censored um, because we do observe the endpoint, um, but so, we do not observe. Go ahead. The question here. I mean. What do we call? And the implication here is if there's right censored, there's also like a left censored kind of version. Yeah. So I mean, intuitively, so, what you're describing, I thought you were going to say I was left censored, but is that? I guess you're going to answer my question right now. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Maybe we'll see. So, so yeah. So either we do not observe the beginning point. But isn't that what you just said though? Isn't that, isn't that what you described? Like we didn't know when they started training. So isn't that left censored? Um, so so yes, according to like this visual way of, of thinking about it. Um, or I've heard, so again, so that there's this parallel here where, I mean, so for example, just how the sausage was made, like I copied and pasted these two, right? So I wrote right censored, then I wrote Copy, I pasted right sensor, changed right to left, uh, and I've changed endpoint. I don't know what happened to that. Well, I don't know why I had the hyphen to begin with, I guess, uh, to beginning, and then put less than and italicized it where greater than was. Um, and so I've seen it. So again, so yes, 
I, I am with you in, in intuition, uh, but I have seen just definitionally, I have seen left sensor defined as the second bullet point under it, that the time to event is less than the observed duration. So might this be, if I can yes, explain you can. your analogy. So, you know, let's suppose these music lessons we're giving this, this group are somehow like remote assignments. We don't, we assume they're doing the homework, but it turns out that four or five students didn't actually start on time and maybe didn't start their homework until four or five weeks after we thought they did. So that would be left centered because you didn't observe the beginning point, but the time to event was less than the observed duration. Yeah, that, that, thank you. In fact, <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah. So if I ever, um, no, that's it. So that is, that is, that seems to be what these, these terms mean. So anyway, so if it's, I think both of these like specific examples now are, are very clear, but just this is a, uh, before going forward, if you ever, you know, if you're presenting uh, some censorship data at a, an academic conference or a business meeting, be sure to cross your T's and dot your I's and read a few authoritative definitions on what, what censoring is exactly, because I've seen both in my very short tenure as a survival, now, survival analyst. Uh, and, then, and then I don't want to get too bogged down on this. Um, and then there's also one that's interval censored. Um, where we know when someone started something, uh, and this is going to be very easy to put into this music uh, lessons scenario. So anyway, so so we can put bounds on it, but we don't know um, exactly when the thing happened. So uh, imagine again, just to finish this off, we know exactly when someone started it. They they started training in our with our music, our remote music lessons. Um, and the way, the way I would think about this, at least most intuitively, I'm sure there are other concrete scenarios that fit this abstract description, but then they, they stay in the study, uh, but they don't, we don't see them at every follow-up period that we would like with that frequency. And so uh, we, so eventually they write to us saying, hey, uh, some time ago, I did the thing. Um, and so you know that it happened before that. Again, you know when they began, but you don't know exactly when it was that the, the thing happened. So that would be interval censored. Uh, and just as a piece of American history, there's Anthony Comstock, who uh, was the New York, he was head of the New York so Society for Suppression of Ice. And is, he's the guy I think of whenever I think of, of censoring. This is a real, this is a real, just an interlude. I just want to let you guys know that censorship was really big in uh, early 20th century America. Like you could get your stuff taken out of the, the post office. I just you know, want to throw that in. People don't use the word, the comstockery is a word. And I just, I just wanted to enter into the parlance a little more. Um, but now we're gonna go back to the topic. So we're going back to censoring. And this is actually the key thing. Um, so we, we've talked about terminology before terminology is important. It helps us be on the same page. But as far as statistical analyses, uh, there's a very, there's the most important thing. And it's that censoring and event time have to be independent. Um, and this can be best exemplified through a couple of examples. Um, so we have the univariate case where we're just looking at uh, the survival function. Uh, we're not we're not looking at we're not breaking out in like subgroups. We're not looking at the effects of certain variables. Um, we're just looking at we're just looking at survival time. Um, and, and this one's very easy to think about in the the medical the original medical context. So imagine that. <clears throat> You know, we're, we're looking at, uh, again, maybe, so we're not looking at any treatment. Uh, we're just looking at what is the survival time for people once they get a certain diagnosis. And um, it makes sense that certain people would be lost to contact or lost in the study if they have really bad health. As their health deteriorates, um, they're more likely to drop out. And that's actually a big problem. Um, so, so that, 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 is, that violates the assumption, just to be clear. So that the process that is gonna to lead to censoring in this case is the same process that is gonna to lead to the event. And that's like, you know, if that's the correlation of one biggest problem that needs to be zero. So oftentimes um, I imagine, and this is something I wish they had covered in more like counterintuitive cases in the book, because this is, this is a very obvious one. Um, but I imagine that 
given like the the causal and I don't know if this is something that's affected you all but there's a big I mean it's for the last I don't know 15 years I guess in the social sciences people have been all about causal inference and so I imagine there's quite a bit of thinking about this this seems like something that's uh really like a very causal inference type theme uh in any case uh moving on so so there's the univariate case where um again but oh just to be clear like well, I'll be clear in a second. I'll be vague for a few more seconds. Uh, a bivariate case uh, would be, and this is the example they give in the book, uh, where they do break, they stratify the, the population into men and women. Again, where in the medical context, they have some disease or something, or they're just, we're just looking at survival times, so we're looking at longevity. Um, if men are more likely to uh, drop out and I believe, so this is the part where, and I have to make sure this is right. And it's not just random among men, but it's uh, something like they, their health, for some reason, they let their health affect uh, the, their attrition, then that would inflate their survival time if you assume that it's random among both. So it becomes, to me, more complicated very quickly. As soon as you're doing any interesting analysis, this assumption becomes uh, much, much trickier to think about. It's very easy in this, like, in, and not stylized, but the, the univariate case where the exact same process governs censoring and causes censoring and the event to happen. But once you get any more complicated, uh, it becomes more complicated to think about. So in the most ideal case, uh, censoring would just be random. Like if you could argue that censoring is just a completely random process. Again, that would be like flipping a coin. Like someone just, you know, every time it's time to report, someone flips a coin. Uh, and if it comes up, you know, tails, they just leave the study. That would be censoring at random if everyone's doing that. Uh, and the coins have the same, well, even if they don't have the same uh, probabilities. Anyway, so that would be censored, but I just don't think that would, ever, that would ever happen. But if you can argue for that, good job. Um, and then slightly less, so, so censoring could be non-random, but you hope that it's non-informative about the event. That's what you, you really hope. Obviously, if it's random, it's non-informative about your event. But if it's uncorrelated with your, with your event, uh, that's also fine for your analysis. Um, but it just seems like that would rarely be the case. Again, I wish they had more examples of this because I feel like that's it's a very interesting thing. But uh, it's, it's talked about very quickly in the book. Um, any questions about censoring before we move on to the Kaplan-Meier estimator? Um, but, but I don't know if it's a question or just a comment, but I imagine uh, censorship, censorship as a, um, when, when you do a study and you lost the follow-up of yeah. the um uh, uh, of the the, the 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 data that you are observing so i've uh i've got an example with the us arrests uh for example that you that there is a list of people they are in prison uh or they went to prison and then they follow up them to see how long it took it uh, how long it took for them to get back to prison again yeah 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 that uh-huh yeah i i've seen that used as so recidivism uh, i've seen that used as a an example of, of survival analysis yeah yeah so you have these people uh and you follow them up to see um, how they behave in prison and how long they stay. So they have different length of stay in prison. Then uh, you, it's like th there is a, um, um, like, so few, few of them get out of prison, other stay, uh, still inside and then they monitor the time uh so the, 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 the people that get out of prison it's like they 
uh, are out, so that they are censoring. And then when they come back in, they, they, they follow them up again. So there is a gap between the, the, the stay inside, the, uh, which will be the censoring uh, time. So you can have the censoring either way uh, at the beginning, at the end of the, uh, of the period, or in the middle as well. So it depends by how you design your study and what are you studying. But the sensing is, it, my, my understanding at least, uh, it's uh, uh, that you are not, so the, the, uh, the element that you are observing is not uh, taking part to the study anymore for a certain length of time. So it's like it's getting out uh, or starting later or getting out and then getting back again. So uh, it's when, when um, so th this is the, um uh, the, the the thing uh, i i uh, i had an idea yeah. about those things yeah to, it to sounds like it, yeah it sounds like you're this is the the taxonomy you can right censored left censored interval censored it sounds like that um but yeah uh okay i'm gonna move on so uh, this is sort of the, the star here, the survival function. Um, so, so we'll discuss it. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is what we're like interested in, in modeling. Uh, and, you know, we're gonna try to explain it, uh, probably not today, but what I mean by explain is use, use uh, properties of the, the units to um, explain different survival curves. But for now, we're just going to start with the simple and univariate case uh, where the survival function, so S of T, is just uh, what it looks like is the probability um, of T. Again, so T is someone's, <clears throat> so this is part of our, so th th everyone uses uh, this notation, but just to be clear, this is the true survival time. Um, so that's what the, the capital capital T is here. Um, and then T is, you know, a, a time we're setting. So you can imagine maybe it's T naught for a specific one. So uh, the probability of surviving past time T. Um, when we actually do the, the Kaplan-Meier estimator, we'll see that another way you can think of it that's synonymous, but a bit more loquacious is the probability of surviving at time T and all previous times. Um, and, and that's synonymous with surviving past time, time t. Um, and so you can imagine, and this will become clear with the pictures, that it's a decreasing function, meaning that as the lower case, t, so, so capital T, we're going to imagine for any given individual, it's fixed, right? Um, and so the lower case t is going to be a decreasing function. So the more as time goes on, so as t increases, the probability of starting past that time decreases. Um, so, so it's a monotonic function. Um, let's see. Okay, that's kind of a big statement, but basically higher values of the survival function um, mean that the thing is less likely to have happened. Again, so that's me trying to take this out of just the, the medical context. And again, we can think about it as publication, right? So if um, if like, S of T is, you know, 0.7 at a certain T, uh, and it's 0.3 at another T, then, uh, that means, well, all right, sorry. So anyway, that, that the paper is more likely to have been published again. And that's kind of this weird thing where the names get in the way of this because I, I was, so it's not publication. So if you, okay, so you, you have been more, your unpublished paper 
is very at risk of not having survived. It's moved on to the hereafter of a journal. Again, if that didn't make any sense, it didn't, it really took a lot of work on my, in my head to keep that straight. So it's not the probability of the thing occurs, it's the probability of having survived uh, in a certain state up to that point. Yeah. Um, and so we can think of a specific example, so I'm not gonna go throw these. In fact, actually, you know what, I'm gonna leave it with, with the papers one. Um, and we'll see, it'll become more concrete a little bit later on. Um, and so, but we need to figure that out. We need to, we want to, we want to know about this. We want to learn about the survival function for us given again, particular application, population, whatever. Uh, so we're going to discuss uh, in the book when well, they have the Kaplan-Meier estimate. I should have written, I don't think I wrote out Kaplan-Meier when I, I did the, sort of the, the, the introduction. Uh, I don't know what you call that slide, but anyway. So yes, this is the KM estimator is Kaplan-Meier. And so it's non-parametric in the sense of it has no pair of parameters. Uh, that it makes no distributional assumptions about S of T. Um, it is just purely calculated from the data. Um, yeah, that's... Can, I, can I just interrupt you uh, for yeah. a second? Can yeah. you imagine a step function? Yes. Yeah? What's a step function? That it's, that there is a, like, a, a straight line to up to some point for those observations that have reached some levels and then drop down a step for the other ones that are lower. So it's it's like uh, just a step function. Just imagine a step function and you figure it out uh, what is going on. And it is no parametrics because it's just, you, you are not using any parameters. So you are just using the data that, that you have and plotting them, uh, each one, as, as the first uh, plot you presented. Then you imagine you connect all the lines and making a step function. The first plot that you presented with the, uh, the bars, okay, the horizontal bars. Then you connect all the bars with a step function and you go down. So that, that, that's the Kevin Mayer uh, visualization of the survival uh, analysis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It it uh, that that is what the, a plotting of the of the Kaplan Meier estimator looks like, and it, no, and it is. It actually just is a uh, a step function estimated from from the data. No, that's great. Um, and so, of course, there's some notation. So actually, so where all the steps occur, or all the the, the so if we were imagining, you know, so, okay, we'll, we'll think about this in terms of a step function. So we have S of D sub K, we're gonna think about that now. Um, and so, you know, and, and I don't know the last time any of you uh, saw a step function written out, they usually have those curly brackets, which I still don't know how to make in LaTeX uh, that indicate all the cases. And so each case is gonna be bound um by if it's either the first or the last a one d sub k and then it'll be between two for all the, the intermediate ones but so all the steps are going to be determined by the unique death times again uh, it's just when the event occurs um and by by unique death that just means that you you have this column that originally i called event uh or could be called duration that it's not like it, it's a continuous variable and because it's a time, but you do not observe even like a regular grid or anything. You have this kind of random smattering of, of times. Um, and so, so for each one of those, uh, you observe the number who died. Again, it could be the number for whom the event occurred. Uh, so that's gonna be Q sub K. So you have D sub K, Small k, where k is k is the, the the you know the last one in the sequence, and then you have r sub k. So we, this is the third and, and final uh, little uh, variable uh, to notice all those who were alive. And by all those, it's, just, it's the the, the number. Uh, so this will be called the risk set. Did I put that? I hope I put that. 
I didn't put that. Anyway, R, R sub k would be called the risk set at, si at time k. Um, and so why risk? This is, oh, yeah, this is the first time I brought up risk. Risk because they're at risk of dying or they're you know, at risk of publication. Um, so we have that. All right, I apologize. This <clears throat> next slide is going to get uh, a, bit, a bit messy. I wish I could have broken this up into three lines. Um, but OK, let's just say right now we're interested in knowing um, the probability that t is greater than d sub k. Now, first of all, it, it seems like arbitrary. Why am I bringing, maybe it seems arbitrary. Like, but just to bring this back to the end goal, keep in mind, we're interested in the probability t is greater than some time point t. OK, so just to so kind of keep that in your mind's eye. And so that's where this comes from. Uh, just now, instead of um, t being a continuous variable over time, uh, we have these unique death points. So for any one of them, right, we can we want to know p, the probability that t is greater than than dk. Again, just a specific realization of of t. Um, and so, using the law of total probability, you can expand that out to the probability that t is greater than that time given that uh, t is also greater than the previous unique death event uh, conditioned on, so conditioning on that. And then this law of total probability, because here we have greater than um, d k minus one. And then here we have the uh, complement of that t less than or equal to uh, d k minus one. And there's so this- but, you know, So basically the, the, the time that the event will, go forward to the next step, given the fact that he reached the previous step. So uh -huh, this that... conditional probability, so the posterior probability. Okay, so. So, so yeah, this, this isn't, like, it's not quite uh, Bayes. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, at least we're not, at least I'm not thinking about it in terms of, of posteriors. It's just a nice, it's a very, genius way to do the fault. I mean, let me know if, if this answers or clears up anything. It's a very genius way to uh, estimate a quantity of interest from the data at hand. So, so to me, I think it's a very, it's one of those ways where, it's one of those moments where you think, man, I mean, it's all very simple math uh, as far as statistics and probability goes, uh, but it's one of those things where you think, okay, I can understand this, but the person who came up to this, shout out, kudos, like, good job. Because, so what, what you do when you reformulate the, again, the thing you're interested in, you, it's not arbitrary, but uh, I'll say you make this kind of out of left field decomposition of it using the law of total probability. You get this, you get this, the, the second bullet point. So um, you can, you just notice that the last one becomes zero. The last, oh, I always forget what you call the two parts of an addition, the, the, the add and the, if someone's a math nerd, they might know that term. Summoned or add and? Summoned, summoned. summoned, that's it. I think that's what it is, S-U-M-M-A-N-D, the sum and. Um, so yes. Uh, <laughs> so, so Miriam this, Webster. Says that sum end is a synonym for add end, so it's sum oh end gosh. or add end. <laughs> uh, so that definitely doesn't uh, this. I hope this detour doesn't subtract <laughs> the presentation. Um, Subtracting. I think that's just a negative add end. Um, okay. Anyway, so so the second sum end becomes zero. And, and we get this. Now, the thing that's going to, it's again, a very clever step. Um, let's see, did I do anything interesting here? I uh, just noted that, again, this is to bring back in the survival operator, the survival function. So again, so we're looking at S dk is defined as the probability that t is greater than dk. And then here, this is just uh, the same thing written out. Now, uh, the interesting thing is um, that this is simply this is 
the survival function at the previous time. And so that's the insight that's going to, to give us, well, okay, we're, we're basically all the way there in this very clever, to me, again, very clever derivation. Um, so, um, but okay, but, but just to go back. So, okay, so here's what we still need to figure out. We still need to figure out how to get this. The probability of surviving, uh, surviving DK, so that T is greater than DK, uh, given that you've survived. That's still the, the tricky part. Um, here the, we're, uh, the, the J becomes a K, or sorry, the K becomes a J. Don't worry about it. But so now, no, now, just, now notice that our probability is a hat, uh, meaning that we're gonna start bringing in our data, finally. So before this was all sort of theoretical, uh, kind of like what if, now it's, we're gonna be as concrete as you can, just <laughs> with just a bunch of letters with subscripts, and not very concrete. That's a very, I'm not a mathematician, but that's the kind of thing a mathematician would say. To be concrete, let's look at variables. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so for some time point J, uh, what you what you do is just at time point J, you have a certain risk set, you have a certain number of units in the sample that could experience the event, uh, and you you subtract off from them the number who for whom the event occurs. So uh, how to make these nice numbers? Um, well, let's just say that our risk set is is ten. So at time J, our risk set is ten. So the, both of these R Js would evaluate to ten. Uh, and then um, two people, um, the event occurs for two people. And so this would evaluate to 0 0.8, the, the fraction would evaluate to 0.8. And so then that means the quantity of interest. So the probability that T is greater than uh, that time point in DJ, and DJ is the time, uh, it would be 0 0.8. And that makes sense. So there were, and that makes sense as an estimator, right? That Someone tells you, all right, we had, uh, if, you, if you think about that, if you abstract away, not abstract away, if you just think that there's only one time point, someone tells you that eight out of 10 people survived and then asks you, was the probability of living past some time point or some past or through some experience? It almost seemed like a trick question and the answer would be 0.8. That's kind of the genius of this is that through such decomp, through all that decomposition, we've got to like a very simple question um, and we've figured out this, conditional probability and and then so the entire curve is actually and I don't know why this hat just doesn't sit <laughs> on top of the s I guess I need to make it the s like a text s instead of a curvy s I think that's the issue uh, anyway so the estimator is going to be just these terms these conditional terms um, just multiplied uh, like, multiplied by each other uh, and that's it. And I find that to be um, obviously, you know, consult the book. This is something that's like worth looking at for a second, um, but I found it to be just a very creative, a very creative solution to this, this issue. And, and in the book, I, I will say they do give a nice explanation of why certain naive estimators uh, wouldn't work. Naive estimators being not taking, so there's actually, and again, I, I should have done this. this. This takes account of censoring because what will happen is if someone gets censored, they're just not going to be in R sub J. So if they get censored at some time prior to J, so J minus five, right? They just won't be in the, the set at R sub J. Um, but if they get censored at, you know, time J plus five, they'll actually, their data will be in the set uh, at time when you're calculating, you know, S, D, J. Again, that was a, a variable salad there. Uh, but the idea is that, and again, consult the book um, for why this is like a very elegant solution to having censoring and needing to estimate a survival curve, because it allows you to use all the information and not have censoring bias your uh, estimate of the survival curve. Uh, and it's also just kind of as a side note, I found that it's also called a product limit estimator. Um, again, this, this is the same, in case you're wondering if there's anything different, this is the same. I, I, uh, I have seen it written slightly differently. Um, 
So you can also write it. I'm not going to go into it, but but you will occasionally see it written in a way that looks a bit different. Where instead of being sort of the survival group, you see it one minus the proportion who died. Again, these are converses. So the proportion who survived, the one minus the proportion who died. So I, I've seen it written both ways. Um, both make sense. Um, okay, and here's what it kind of looks like. Now there is something I. There's something incorrect about this that I realized. So I created this graph uh, and I realized that it's actually not super easy to draw these in R. Um, Francesca basically alluded to why this is technically incorrect. So all right, I, won't, I won't make anyone say it, but basically all the these, you can think of all the slanted lines as R doing interpolation. Uh, that shouldn't that shouldn't be done. So this is not just to be clear. This is kind of a Kaplan Meier is kind of kind of what it would look like, um, but this is not a Kaplan Meier curve. Just to be clear. I mean, so, they're both they're both approximations. And it's it's hard to say this one's necessarily worse than the other one. It's just not. It's just not the standard form, right? Right. Right, I'm trying to think. So, so the, the way that you would imagine this is that we start off. It looks like there was a sample. This is a randomly generated. I, I guess every time I render this, it's different because you know it's randomly generated. Uh, so it looks like this time it started off with 56 people in the sample. I imagine the people uh, at time I don't know two or three, uh, someone dies, and so what you would normally see is this a steep, you know, I mean, a vertical drop, uh, and so it interpolates. So really. What I, what I guess I'm trying to get at is that the interpolation happens. I, I don't want to spend too much time on this because this was just an artifact of uh, me not figuring out how to make vertical lines in R. Um, but uh, the drop should, if there's any interpolation, it should happen before, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, that it actually happens. R, R is a bit late to the fact. Um, but yeah, but there's not much time left. And I just want to show, so like just to make it a bit concrete, it's like, how did I make this? Or how did R make this under my supervision? And it's, this will help with the, the variables, I think. So again, so in my case, I have kind of a discrete time simulation of continuous time. Um, so there's at, at time points, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, it goes all the way up to a hundred, I think. Um, and so uh, D, which ideally would have been the second column, is gonna be the unique death times. Now notice that there are no deaths in the simulation until uh, the fourth period. And so that's when we get a Q again. So Q sub K. So in this case, Q four would be one. One person died. So or sorry, no. That this is actually this is confusing. Now Q one happens again at my time four. And it equals one because Q is the number who died or who had the event happen, and um, the risk. And so again, I'm just kind of like this is behind the curtains. Me trying to figure this all out. So the R at that time, the R at the subsequent time is actually going to be 55. The R at time Q1 was 56. So when I had to go do this, I had to, or when I did this, I had to go create R before. So uh, so to get the, the right risk set. Um, and then anyway, so this is all how this is done mechanically. Uh, and then for each one of these, either one person or zero person could die in a simulation. So the survival prop at that time was either 0.98 or one. And just to be clear, that is this term. This is the survival prop. That is how it's obviously very easy to do an R. Um, so you have a survival prop, and then um, you can just mechanically get the Kaplan Meier estimator by doing a cumulative product on uh, the survival prop column. And so that's, I mean, that's how non-parametric it is. You just have just a- uh, can, you, can you go back to the previous slide just and hold it for a minute? So, see. so you're doing every time step here. Yeah. In the product, not just the death times. You could just do the death times, right? Because everything else would be one. Like you have a row there with survival probability of one and that doesn't contribute to the cumulative sum of the product. Yeah, it doesn't change it at all, yeah. Yeah, so I, so I could have filtered it for uh, every time 
you know, I could have filtered this where every time that D is, uh, I guess, the same as the previous row, I could have gotten rid of D. And that would be more true to what an actual data set that would look like. formally presented as, yeah. Yeah, so just for the simulation, that's uh, this is how it happened. But yes, again, if I wanted to say, this is what the, the an actual data set would look like, exactly. Very good. Yeah, I would have filtered it. Uh, and anyway, so I mean, that's it. So I, I, I hope that it's a little bit clearer. Again, again, it's just a, a lot of variables that have subscripts. Um, but the idea is that it's actually pretty amazingly simple to calculate uh, a Kaplan-Meier estimate, and then you just plot it in ggplot. Uh, and it's that's the same graph as before. Now it's just ggplot, so the base R. But I guess that's it. That's time. I somehow managed to make a 15 minute presentation into an hour, which is <laughs> something I've always, <laughs> I'm consistently able to surprise myself with. Um, <clears throat> go ahead, John. Uh, just, you know, thanks. <laughs> that was, that was really, really good. Um, cool. All right. So, um, Let's see. So we're about not quite halfway through. Um, so yeah. So we got at least one more week of this. <laughs> and yeah, I think I think one more week is is enough, regard okay. regardless of how far I am into the chapter. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll plan to to do twelve in two weeks, and then uh, my Ling, are you still on for thirteen in about a month? And, yeah. That okay. Be Excellent. And then we'll be done with the book. So exciting. Yeah, I feel like the other cohorts are catching up to us. Is that right, or is am I? I I haven't really paid attention. Um, it's funny because I upload all the videos, but I haven't like kept track of. I did have that feeling. I'm like, man, it seems like they're getting through this faster than we did. Um, I guess, I mean, both of them have people who are present right now, actually. And so, like, I'm guessing the second time through the book, you know, you can kind of work through what are, what's going to be presented. And we missed uh, several weeks, I think, or at least a few weeks. Um, that we had various reasons to not meet. And so, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see there, what was cohort two? Uh, just, uh, I'm not sure if you finished chapter eight, but they continued chapter eight last time. And let's see, where is three? Is in five or six, I think six, yeah. So, they're coming up on us. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I'm just looking at the, the chat. There's some great information in here <laughs> from callers. Subtry it. So it, it is a new word. Yeah, subtrahend. Uh, subtrahend. Or wow. subtra subtrahend. Uh, it's subtractend. And then the CT became H because English. Um, Federica posted the only a genuinely useful. <laughs> our survival yeah i was i was looking for the u.s arrest um thing that i did it i can't find it anymore so i don't know maybe i need to uh check on the other computer because i i used another computer when i did that uh but that was very very interesting very useful so if if you do the the follow the step with survival the, the the baggage, uh, yeah, that, that 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 everything became became more clear. Yeah. So. Just something I don't know. Neither here nor there. But the thing that I think is funny. I don't know if funny is the right word. But for any survival analysis other than mortality, death can lead to censorship. Um, it, you know, any survival analysis involving people, like they, they didn't actually, you know, publish, so they didn't die in the survival, but they actually died, and that's why they didn't publish. So, anyway, 
It's a that it's is, complicating terminology. That is funny. It actually took me a second to pick up what you were putting down there, John, but I got it. Yeah. Anyway. All right. So we'll meet next week. And I will see everybody on Slack. <laughs>